welcome to this week's On The Couch. Uh, today I've got Scott Frew, um, a long-term friend of mine, a mentor of mine, an industry, they call us veterans when we get to this age. Um, so an industry veteran, um, an ARN Hall of Famer, an enormously uber successful entrepreneur who's built and sold multiple businesses, been doing it since the age of 20 something, if I remember yep. correctly. So Scott, mate, thank you very much for joining us today. No problems, Ronnie. Fresh in from Spain. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. So Scott, mate, tell us a little bit, you know, there's a bunch of people that'll be watching this that don't know much about Scott Frew. Um, okay. You know, even though you are the international man of mystery. <laughs> Tell us a that was bit my about first you. LinkedIn profile. <laughs> uh, so, born in the country, just outside of Dubbo. Um, moved to the city when I was about six. Uh, parents worked. Dad eventually started an ad agency. Sort of climbed up the ladder. Sold his own business. Oh, sorry, didn't sell it. He closed it down because he was the main copywriter for the business, which is why I always build my businesses not to rely on me being in there. Uh -huh. um, Went to public school in Taramara, nothing exciting, um, but realized very quickly, just like I did at school, that I had a problem with authority, so I couldn't work with anyone or for anyone else. So I started programming at a young age, probably 15-ish, and then sort of went up, became a COBOL programmer for a couple of years. COBOL's a really old language. <laughs> um, and then decided that there was no one that really knew anything about how to run networks. And networks in those days were TV, coax, cable going between, or XTs, or even earlier than that. Um, so I joined with two other guys that had come over from New Zealand to start a competitor in the distribution space for against the Novell distributor. Uh -huh. um, and it was a very simple business plan. The current distributor then would sell direct as well as to resellers. I went, what if we don't sell direct? <laughs> of course, the business flooded over to us. We we were only 21, 22 sort of age. Sold that ultimately to Netcom, the motor manufacturer, because they wanted to get in the networking space. Realized I couldn't work for anyone else. Went out, started Land Systems. And I took Land from zero to just over 200 million, um, mostly with Cisco and SMC. Sold that to Westcon. Um, so St. Leonard's, you've got the Westcon building there. That's the old company. Retired for a few years, sat on some boards. And then I came back and started Distribution Central, which was the everything but Cisco distributor. Uh -huh. And that's right next door to Westcon. So that entire front complex is my old <laughs> company. <laughs> um, but no, you know, I, I joined again. Nick came in late in Land Systems, but I joined back with uh, Nick because we are uh, yin and yang. And uh, took that business from nothing to just over half a billion dollars when we sold it. Uh, I think Nick's taken it up to another 700 plus. Um, so... I try to build fast growing businesses that change, and I hate to use the word disrupt because everyone uses disrupt, but I walked into a business that has existing multi-billion dollar global players and grew very, very quickly. And the reason is, is because nothing had changed since, you know, I was away for five years, I came back and literally the same stuff was going on. And if you look at um, the large scale distributors, it's all about price. There's no value to it. If you want support, you've got to ring the manufacturer if you're lucky. So what I did actually, when I started, I bought a little company called Firewall Systems and it was a security focused distributor with WatchGuard and a couple of other rats and mice. And what I realized immediately after me getting on the phone, because I'm doing the sales to start with, that 60% of the firewalls were being bought without maintenance. Uh -huh. And this is really where the story starts to get interesting. So I teamed up with another, another buddy of mine that I've been with since we were five and he's an awesome programmer whereas I was okay. <laughs> um, and I said, I want you to build me a configurator like, you know, Apple or Dell or whatever, when you go and you configure a PC up. Uh, I want you to build a configurator that forces maintenance. Because if you buy a firewall without maintenance or any security product without maintenance, it's not a security product because you're not getting the updates. Uh -huh. So we did that and I caused all sorts of grief. I had resellers ringing and yelling and said, here's the name of my competitors if you want to buy firewalls without maintenance because it's, it's irresponsible. There you go. There's their phone number, here's the contact, off you go. And of course, eventually they, you know, it all fell over because I had the engineers to support them, whereas the other guys don't. So now I have a business that's transacting 100% of the products with maintenance. Uh -huh. So that's at least a third jump in revenue. But of course, 12 months down the track, who's chasing their renewals? So yeah. that's where the, the current business came out of was building an engine to put our arms around the entire product life cycle. And, that's really what took DC through. So the last year, 
before we sold out. Um, you know, we walked into the year at 43% ish of our revenue already booked through renewals. So I only had to chase half the business. And it's, uh, it made a big difference to um, our manufacturers and the resellers that we were transacting with. And then I spun the software out uh, well, seven years ago, eight years ago. And now, now we're running the largest global organizations in distribution in vendor land. And we've just signed three large global resellers. Fantastic. So, so that's the short version. <laughs> and it took you all of about 40 seconds before you gave the first critical piece of valuable information to the people who are watching this, which is I build businesses where I'm not the guy who's resp who's core to the business. That was one of the first things that you said as you yep. started talking, right? And that's why I love having you as one of my mentors, because it's just those little pieces of information that you let go yep. that, you know, if you pick them up, you can do a lot with. And that's something that, you know, I, I say it in our business a lot. I say, make yourself redundant yep. to everybody who comes into the business. Make yourself redundant, not because we're going to make you redundant, but because it allows you to then go and do something else. But that actually right. scares people. It does. So the reason I've been successful is, is I employ people that are smarter than me. Yep but I take the risk because they're not prepared to take risk. Uh -huh. So there's this massive pool of really awesome, intelligent people that could blow me away, but they won't take risk. Uh -huh. And when you say, make yourself redundant, which I've used that pitch before, they're like, oh, no, that's a bit scary. I, w I want to be valuable. Absolutely. So, no, 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 you want to move upstream, right? And, and you know, for some people, they don't have to move upstream, right? No, that's right. If they want to stay there and they want to do what they're doing, that's great. Yep. Just let us know and we'll make sure that works for you, right? Well, and that's an interesting point. Um, I, you know, we were in great places to work as well for uh -huh. five or six years. And my best was 14, so well done on beating me on that one. <laughs> um, in a large organization, um, I went and spent a good part of a year just focused on reading books about motivation and what drives people and all that sort of stuff. And what I was actually chasing was operations and accounts people, because I can drive marketeers, I can drive salespeople, anyone that's in that sort of space. Mm -hmm. But these guys come in every day and process the same order over and over and over mm -hmm. again, and the, and the bean counters and do exactly. they're a different exactly. personality, right? They are completely different. So I was trying to work out a way to lift them outside of just doing this, you know, carrot and stick stuff. Mm -hmm. right? so I read uh, Daniel Pink's Drive book. Yep. I'm reading through it. It's all, very interesting book about uh, motivation and pay and all sorts of stuff. And at the end it says, but if it's operations or accounts, basically it's carrot and stick, that's it. <laughs> yeah. And that's and that's the really interesting thing though, right? When you look at what you've done building businesses, you spend a lot of time thinking about the front end and what goes on in that. But part of what's making you successful as well is that you're not just concerned about the front end, you're not just concerned about the product that you solve, the problem that you're solving for the market, but you're also concerned about each and every individual back in your organization. That's right. Well, there's, there's two points to that. It is absolutely, a distribution is about staff. The, the people that work for me are the differentiator between me and anyone else because we don't own anything. Uh -huh. Now, forgetting the IP that we've built that we've pushed out into iAsset, we don't own anything. So we've got to be more professional, smarter, faster, better. And by the way, we're not going to sell on price. We're going to be more expensive because uh -huh. if they don't see the value, we're not having the right conversation with them. Yeah, absolutely. So I do focus heavily on the back end because distribution, you can't make more money. You can't drive prices up out uh -huh. of the market because you're not the vendor, you're not in control of that. But you can increase productivity or save money for all the people that are underneath you that you're servicing. Uh -huh. So operations and accounts are critical people because you don't want them spending a minute clicking a mouse button if you can get a you know a robot or whatever to do it. So that they're just doing the more creative stuff uh -huh. within their realm. Um, not the accountants, we don't want them being creative though, right? Well, no, no, no. <laughs> not in that way. And you spend an awful lot of money with auditors to make sure they're not being creative. <laughs> Absolutely. So you, you, you've changed now, you're out of distribution. Yes. Right? For maybe the next well, five, I am. For maybe the next five no, years. No, no, I'm not going back to distribution. <laughs> so if you're not going to go back to distribution and you look at what's happening now in the future state of the market, right? Yeah. And there's been a lot of discussions around, you know, what does the distributor of the future look like with yep. cloud, yep. for example, and the, the total different way people are buying and consuming, et cetera. What do you think the distributor of the future is going to look like? So there's this old argument that, um, you know, distribution's dead about every 10 years or so. There's no point having a distributor, a vendor can go direct. There is still leveraging and relationships that exist inside that channel. So forgetting the, the product delivery, what it is, uh -huh. um, you know, Distribution Central and the other distributors around the world have a relationship with a set of resellers. And you are trying to take cost out of their business and service them so that they can then engage with their customers better. Uh -huh. So that never goes away. It doesn't matter whether it's a coffee cup or a, a TV or a router. It doesn't matter. You still, 
as a reseller, you can't deploy as many resources as you'd like to deploy to serve as a customer's business initiative. Uh -huh. You need to rely on supply chain if it's physical, or at least help in the back end for hybrid cloud configuration or let me give you a great example. There is a reseller that we're just signed on now with our, we haven't released it yet, it's a cloud module, and it ingests a price list from one of the vendors, I'm trying not to mention names, it ingests a price list which is released every month, so the price change every month on the cloud thing, and then they ingest a file that is all of the consumption that has been done for every one of their customers, and they currently have six people managing this process. Uh -huh. And to me, that's just like, I can do that in seconds. Yep. So um, if I was at Distribution Central now, and I was still running, you know, building the software inside DC, that's what I'd be doing. I'd be going to the resellers and saying, here's some software that will process this. So you can move those six people into forward sales or uh -huh. engineering work or whatever. So there's still that symbiotic, you know, you talk about partnerships. When the channel comes together properly, it sings. Uh -huh. And my job today out of distribution is to make sure all of the partners are seeing and make sure all of the data is flowing up and downhill without anyone touching it because then they can deploy people into more interesting, exciting or growth opportunities. So a lot about efficiency then. Yeah. Realistically, it's all about, you know. Well, especially cloud, right? If you're selling a $20, I've used a processor for 15 seconds. How, how do you get an accountant to type an invoice for that? Yeah, absolutely. Right, it's got to be automated. It's the only yep. way to do it. Yep. Cool. So in terms of that, right, that's the future of the distributor. Um, a lot of things now as well about the future of the channel yep. and how the channel is working. And there's a lot of partner to partner going on, which is a conversation yes. that obviously at Incentral, we love the conversation partner to partner being partner obsessed. What's your view on the future of the channel and, and that whole reseller network and what that's going to look like now? So my view is I've been, I've watched partner, part, partner to partner for 30 years. Mania has been generating a lot of those partner to partner. Um, Mania is a, a, a program that DC slash Arena run to take the, the heads of the top resellers away and isolate them. Uh -huh. Basically, we have a good time, we drink plenty of beer and fall over and all that sort of stuff. But in the business context, it has built relationships from guys that are strong in storage to guys that are strong in networking to guys that are strong in security. That has been going on. There is, it's accelerating, I think, at a rate because, again, if the distributors aren't providing the security service, then the partner has to go out somewhere else because they're not security guys, they're storage yeah. guys or, you know, they're migration of Outlook guys, whatever uh -huh. it is. So I don't think that's ever changed. And I think one of the, the points, I think, uh, before I came here was what prevents that happening? In Australia, I think what prevents it happening is trust. Uh -huh. And so provided you can maintain your cycle of trust, and that's something um, we have spent, I personally have spent a lot of time on, and Nick's the same, which is we never go over a reseller. We never, you know, there's this rules base, which we never do. Uh -huh. And if you do that in 30 years, people will trust you. But when you get new guys, especially when the IT market started, it was Cowboy City, and there's still a few in there, but Cowboy City, no one trusted anyone, yeah. right? So provided you can build that trusted ecosystem around you of other partners, and uh, then you're fine. But as soon as someone breaks the trust cycle, then it all falls apart. Look, absolutely, and, and that's, this is a thing that I've had for seven years now that we've been running within Centra. I didn't have that foresight seven years ago. I just assumed people would trust me, and you're right, they didn't, right? And it took a long time to build that trust. Yep. And it takes just you know one tiny thing that would kill that, that yeah. trust. And even to this day, um, I kind of look back and go, you know, I probably should have called ourselves a distributor of services because I think people have the mindset that you're a distributor, you don't go direct yep. more often than not, right? Yep. Whereas with our business, because we didn't call ourselves a distributor, it's like, when are you gonna start going direct, Ronnie? Because so many businesses have also done that, right? They've started as purely channel, and they get a taste for going direct, and a taste for we cutting out the content, middle right? <laughs> and, uh, and away they go, I'll just let that one start there. So, yeah, so that, that whole partner to partner and trust, and I think trust is a big problem in our industry, full stop. Absolutely. Right, you know, I don't know if you heard me say recently um, that I will write a book one day, and I probably need to be out of the industry before I write it, and it's gonna be called <laughs> taking, taking the IT out of bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Because there's enough in there that's bullshit. Well, I think I've got the same problem. So when I walked out of distribution, I had smashed the distributor market, built the sixth largest distributor in the region, and then I walked out and said, right, other distributors, I want you to use my software. <laughs> and they're like, hang on. <laughs> that's right. So we get the fox in the hen house yeah, now, right? That's right. And so iAsset. Mm -hmm. iAsset's um, you know, really going well for mm -hmm. you. It's another you know, fantastic Scott vision 
um, and iAsset is something is a platform that you've built yep. that allows people to do what? So the objective of iAsset is to run channels and product life cycles. Um, it's very simple. If you're a, anyone can run it, vendor, distributor, or reseller, and control their own base of product. So there's three types of product in the world. There's cloud, so consumption contracts mm -hmm. coming out. There's hardware and maintenance, and then there's large scale software contracts like uh, Microsoft, Spire and Lara and all that sort of stuff. So the engine puts its arms around all the data flowing for all of those three types of products. And if you're a vendor, um, like we have, um, you know, VMware and Honeywell and all those sort of guys, it manages the global channel for them. So they know which aggregator or distributor sold the product, which reseller or service providers put it into the customer, and then make sure that all of the billing's working through all of those flows. Now, the, the secret behind the source is not actually, that's a great thing. And if you look at, um, you know, one of our customers, 95 minutes was their ROI because they were losing two million a month just on cloud aggregation or cloud contracts, right? Every other one of our customers at reseller all the way up is within six months, usually three, but some are a bit slower to move. The ROI is incredible because they've never tried to put their arms around life cycle. Mm -hmm. but the sales guy, the VP of sales, whoever it is, is always focused on net new because that's what they get judged on. Not actually, do you know, 22 times the initial sale is usually what you can drag behind in renewals and upgrades and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So when people move, you get the mind shift to, and it's getting easier because cloud is exactly that. Mm -hmm but just put over the other product sets, it starts to change and it changes dramatically. And if you get a vendor and a distributor and a reseller that are all running the instance, they all start talking together, you remove loads of people out of that, up to 22 phone calls a renewal, for argument's sake. Right. And if you're doing a Sophos or a WatchGuard, one of the small firewall renewals and it's 200 bucks, as soon as anyone it's touches that phone, you've lost money. at any of the levels, you've lost money and they're calling each other saying, was this right, is that right, et cetera. Yeah. So the engine is a platform that eliminates all of that manual process for the large scale number of transactions that are going on in the channel. And then, you know, you look at, um, give you some examples of where ecosystems exist. And, and this is an ecosystem product, not just a, an app. Uh -huh. um, if you look at, um, say, DC, when I own DC, if they touch anything under, say, $5,000, I was absolutely losing money because, you know, if you're at six point margin for a distributor. Yep. So then I built a team in Manila that sat on top of the DC engine and they just email chased. And obviously, you know, it's an arbitrage thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's now gone up to 10. Some of the guys in the US, we're now talking uh, 100. So then it's all shifting, but they've got their arms around the data and they've never, ever had this data before. And then, you know, there's tales of woe where people, I think the biggest problem in the channel is people are using systems that aren't designed to do what they should be doing. So mm -hmm. my biggest competitor at iasset.com is Excel. Right. And there are still some very large organizations trying to run an install base on Excel. Uh -huh. And it's like, um, you know, another organization, not mentioning names, deployed a large scale ERP system just recently globally. And I mean, we were in for the life cycle thing. CIO says, no, 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 we'll, we'll build that in our ERP system. And of course, they've been bought because it all fell apart. Right. So there's lots going on with our asset in a ecosystem point of view and it does make all of those partners more efficient and it does it very very quickly okay and so that's what that's where your passion sits at the moment absolutely but again you're doing it in a way where you're not you know the linchpin in the business where well, it's not totally i'm not a developer i'm a relationship guy you're a relationship you're a funder <laughs> and so in, you know you've been very successful there mm -hmm. is no doubt and there's no point hiding that in any way shape or form what do you do with your success how do you actually enjoy the spoils of your success well, that's a good question. Um, so now the boys are kind of, you know, at the end of their school age, and I've got a 21 and, and one just going through HSC at the moment. Um, you know, a lot of the focus is on them as they're growing up. Um, I'm very much, I'll give you a story to put in context. And I tell a lot of guys that I mentor or I've, when I've done speeches for some of the magazines, everyone forgets the end game. So what actually happens is I grew up in a small town country, they didn't own the house, they didn't own the car, you know, blah, blah, blah. Built my way through it, and when I sold my first business for big bucks, I spent a year wandering around going, what do I do now? Uh -huh. Because if your fundamental drive is to be independent, and you get, it's like the donkey getting the carrot, donkey eats the carrot and goes, what's next? What's next, right? Uh -huh. So you go through this whole psychological shift, I guess. Um, and when I came back and started DC, it was more about 
I could see opportunity that was just begging to be solved. And I see it every day in, you know, from coffee shops to, you know, restaurants or whatever. You walk in there and I just see the opportunities and that's what drives me. I, I think I can change something for the betterment of the people that are involved in that process. Uh -huh. So that's what drives me. How do I enjoy success? Well, I'm a boating guy, which everyone knows. So, you know, when um, BOW asked me one year, they said, so why are you doing it again? I said, it's all about the next boat. <laughs> Bigger boat. Bigger boat. Well, actually, I went downsized. You did go smaller, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. I always say, you know, you just need a mate who's got a boat, so I'm really glad to be mates with you. That's right. Um, and you keep that boat over off the coast of Europe, right? So yeah, yeah. You spent two the, months in Spain? In Mallorca, yes, I did. Two months off the coast of Spain working off your boat. I think yep. that's everybody's ideal dream. I think that's a lot of people would love well, to Well, I grew up that. with a dream that everyone was sitting on the beach on their laptops. For me, it's on a boat. Which is wonderful. Yeah. And so when you're doing that and you're sitting on the boat, you know, and you're thinking about what's next, you know, you, you've got other interests as well, mm -hmm. right? You, you different boards, you invest in little organizations, et cetera. What do you look for in an organization that would make you go, you know what, that's something that I want to put some time, effort and money behind. So I'm, I'm looking for those disruptors. Like if it's, if it's the same old thing, just in, in different color, that doesn't excite me. I'm looking uh -huh. for people that are actually changing things. For instance, I'm an investor in a company in the UK that um, stabilizes viruses because if you want, uh, so stabilizes vaccines. If you want to transmit these products around Africa, you can't refrigerate them. So, you know, they've stabilized a bowl of vaccines and all this sort of stuff so that they can get to it. That, that interests me because it actually has a benefit to a greater um, uh, part of the population but it's technology still, it's still this disruption uh -huh. piece. Or, um, you know, I mean, a Vietnamese art collection, bizarrely enough. Um, but again, that's about conserving um, all of this art that's come out of Vietnam and almost protecting it from all of the art dealers and all the rest of it because it's built as a collection rather than a, you know, selling artwork type things. So, you know, they do conservation in England and all that sort of stuff. So I'm looking for something that's a bit a little different and uh, something I can add value to with my history and background. Which is wonderful. Now, we, we were having a chat a little while ago and I was talking about my trip and how I had some time to go through Monaco. Yep. And you told me something interesting about the Prince of Monaco. I think, <laughs> I think you should share that with, share that with our audience. Uh, no, something, let's just uh, introduce someone to his wife, but it wasn't the Prince. Anyway. It wasn't the Prince. <laughs> no, no, it was his nephew. Oh, okay. And, and that sort of started that whole process. Yeah. So you had an influence there. I yeah, well, I just happened to be out on the boat one day. And, you know. As you do yes. in Monaco. <laughs> As you do. So, avid reader. Yes. Right? You mentioned that. You know, you spent a year reading all sorts of books on motivation, etc. What are you reading now? Uh, right now, I'm reading a book called Homo Deus, which is Man God uh -huh. in Latin, um, which is all a futuristic book about where we're headed and what's going to happen to mankind and, you know, um, interesting points like obesity now kills more people than war, famine, disease, everything. Just that one wow. uh, piece. And, you know, are we going to evolve? Everyone's chasing Nirvana, which is living forever. And what impact does that have? And uh -huh. is living forever? You've downloaded your brain to a computer, or you know, you're augmented uh -huh. in some way. So I'm always trying to look forward to the next ten years or whatever, because it, if you it, you take it from the Japanese, they think two hundred years ahead. If you do that, then you can work your way back, uh -huh. rather than if. You know, a lot of the challenges I have with American corporations is they only look the next quarter. Uh -huh. And you cannot build strategic businesses if it's just every quarter rather than where are we actually going. Right. So and there's another little tidbit there for mm. people who are entrepreneurs. Think about what you're doing strategically. Don't think just about the next. Well, think about So the easiest way to explain it is I spend all of my time outside the business. Right. And if you are outside the business looking in, the business is for me is the product. doesn't matter what the business is actually doing underneath. Here's the product. What does that look like when you hand it off to someone else? Now, I might actually float ISF because it's a it's an IP company rather than uh, a sales organisation. But I, if you go to Arrow, I would hope, and Westcon, uh, and I'm, well, their con guys aren't around anymore. But if you went to them and said, "How's your experience of the product they bought?" I would hope because they both grew significantly that they'd be happy with everything that they were were sold. Right. And that, so that's what I'm doing. I'm building the product. Uh -huh. The people inside are actually doing whatever needs to be done inside the product. Uh -huh. But if you're an entrepreneur, what does it look like at the point you step out? And it doesn't mean you have to sell it, but you might step away and let someone else run it or whatever the case may be. Okay. So that's what you're reading now. What's a book you'd recommend to people to read? Uh, the number one book I recommend anyone that's looking to become an entrepreneur or start their own business is The E-Myth. The E-Myth. 
Yeah, the image Michael revisited Gerber. it is now, isn't it? Well, it is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's a little bit American and a bit fluffy, but the core parts of it are things like not doing it, but getting outside and looking at it. Um, and if you only do that, when you're starting up, obviously you don't have time, you need to be doing things. But if you only do it for half an hour a day, and then next year it might be an hour a day, mm-hmm. and then eventually, when it's big enough, you're always out. Mm-hmm. Um, consistency of customer service. You know, if I, if I gave you a computer that ran like a dog, and then the next day ran really fast, and then ran like a dog, and you'd, you'd pull your hair out, this is terrible. If I gave you a computer that's rang slow all the time, literally all the time, you'd be, you'd be fine, because you don't know any dish, that's right. Um, but I think my favorite one is service recovery. So every business I've had, and this will always happen in perpetuity, something will go wrong. Someone will screw up in the organization or they're, you know, someone you're relying on, um, fails, whatever it is. Customers don't remember the failure. They remember what you did to fix it. Absolutely. Right. And then over time, if you go five years down the track, you won't remember that I fixed it, but you'll have a positive imprint in your brain. Uh-huh. You're not sure why, because you've forgotten all the detail of, you know, the box blew up. But that will stay for you, will stay with you forever. So service recovery has always been a huge thing for me, mm-hmm. and I've always let myself be accessed by every customer I've ever dealt with, mm-hmm. email, websites, whatever. It'll come to me because I want to know, and I want to go and find out why we're failing in a particular way and mm-hmm. fix it, not only for them, but fix it so it doesn't happen again. Right. So was that a book called Service Recovery? No, that was or in was the just the concept of that yeah. out of the EMS. Yeah, 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 cool. Look, that was one of the first books I read. Mm-hmm. I must say it was one of the most um, prolific impacts. Yep, was definitely from that book, and I think it's a great recommendation. And if you are a you know a young person now, um, you've just come into this industry, or you've been in this industry for four or five years, and you spend time and you look at people like yourself who have been successful, who are sort of prolific in the market, etc. And you're thinking about where am I going to take my career? What am I going to do? What are some of the tips you'd give them in our industry as it exists today about what they should be considering and thinking of? Very simple. If they're not doing AI or robotics in some form, it doesn't have to be physical robotics, but in in that market, they're going to very, very quickly be driven out. Uh Um, You know, I'm a... um, I'm a little bit with Elon Musk in the the singularity concern, which is if AI accelerates, because governments never move faster than IT. Um, but I would be in that AI space um, or uh, data analytics trying to provide, and this is what we've been doing at iAsset is, we've been accumulating masses of data and we've now got a new guy on board who's there to interpret the information and then build the intelligence back to the customer base uh-huh. across the channel. Um, so I'd be in AI, robotics, I'd absolutely be in security. I mean, security is never going to go away. Uh-huh. Um, so they're the three key areas off the top of my AI, head. robotics, security. Yep. Excellent. So in your time, you know, you've, you've been exposed to a whole stack of different people. Tell me about an amazing dinner that you've had with an amazing person. Oh, probably, it wasn't dinner, but immediately jumps to mind is Dan Warmanover, who was the CEO of NetApp. I mean, the... You know, you think of the scale of his organization, which uh-huh. was billions of dollars. And I was just curious to hear, because I've only run hundreds of millions of dollars worth of business. So I, up until, let's say, half a billion now, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. And then when I go over that, I'm out of my comfort zone. But he's running multi-billion dollar businesses with so many people. It's like, how do you deal with that? Yep. You know, I know, you, I know the management structures and all that sort of stuff. But conceptually, you can't touch every customer. You don't know every employee in the organization. You're across the globe. I just It's a different Very thought different. process, a different dynamic. Yep, and that's a question that I've actually asked. What, did you, what, what were the top three things that you picked up out of that, of how someone like that ne- Never build a business that that's big. <laughs> <laughs> <That's that big. laughs> <laughs> no, and, and I, I joke about that, but I actually like talking to customers, and I get frustrated if I get completely removed. Yep. Now, obviously, um, you know, at DC, I couldn't talk to every reseller, and you know, there are individuals that have dealt with my companies that I've never met before. Uh-huh. But I still like to talk to people, and that was, you know, the mania driver was the whole. I spent a week just listening to customers, uh-huh. and this is a critical thing because a lot of people forget about that. They build they do, things they? that they think the customer wants, yep. and not everyone is Steve Jobs. So you need to go and engage that end customer <laughs> and find out what they actually want, whether you're delivering the right service and those sort of things. So I'd never work at that scale. What I do, From a, uh, an iAsset point of view, what I did learn out of those large scale organizations is that their ability to innovate, let me come back a step. If you're NetApp, 
you build this awesome box, then the job is to go and sell the box. The entire organization's energy is at the selling the box. I'll throw in Oracle or SAP or whatever in the back, I'll put some bean counters and some operations delivery guys and warehouse and all the rest of it, but we're just gonna sell the box, right? And we're gonna tell the market how many we sold each quarter. The problem is they never actually think internally about efficiency of delivery to the market. Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating because when I go in there and say, well, and not necessarily with NetApp, but I go in there and say, right, well, let's say your renewal rates, usually the hardware renewal rates at about 50 or 60%. What if we drove that to 90, which, you know, that's what we were running at DC. That's an enormous amount of free money, Absolutely. what I call free money, sitting on the table. It's just the customer hasn't been told by the reseller because the distributor doesn't know yep. and NetApp doesn't know the chain. Um, so my frustration comes, in, in particularly in the US, is their employment is different to us mm -hmm. in that they are at will employees. Yes. So, you know, you see the movies where they get fired They're and fired. they pack the box and out they go. Well, you can't do that here or in Europe. Mm -hmm. You have to go through a process. So I think there's a general... Um, risk averse attitude in the employees because if they do take Stick the their risk neck out, they could be gone and it falls over they're out the door right um and of course our it industry is getting older which you know i was having some fun with uh, andrew thomas the other day um as they get older risk adversity increases because mm -hmm. you know they're getting towards the end of their um uh, job employ employment yeah. employability yeah employability <laughs> So they are even more scared to make decisions as, yep. as the grey hair increases. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the this is the big challenge for us, is to try and get these large scale organisations to actually innovate internally, mm -hmm. even though they might be fantastic innovators in the market right. that they're servicing. Okay, which is really interesting as well. And you talk about this and you, you look at what separates a lot of people from others, and it is that ability to take risk, it's ability to back yourself, yep. right? And to actually just go out there and throw caution into the wind. But when you've got all these extraneous factors around you. And there's so many people I talk to who go, oh my God, I'd love to set up my own business, but you know, I've got to pay for the school bills and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And it's like, well, where's your risk? So trust right? me, even my hairdresser in the UK, when I sit down, because she knows I'm an entrepreneur, I'd really like to scale out my business. I said, well, professional services business are challenging. You need to sell something beyond. You need to leave trailing revenue yep. so that you make money while you're sleeping. Oh, yeah, okay. So what are you going to do about it? Oh, you know, I'll think about, you know, I'd really love to. <laughs> That's right. So, well, how bad do so you really want So there's gunners and right? doers, right? Absolutely. Now, the thing about risk is you have to put everything on the line, uh -huh. everything. And you have to be comfortable doing that. And sometimes it's scary. Like, all of my companies have faced periods of adversity without fail. I don't just make magic companies that happen every year. You know, uh, DC, the first year of DC, I've never, at that stage, never built a company that I've lost money in any year. DC was like, just, just, oh, we claimed it at the end, but you know, this, I'm pulling my hair out yeah. because I never wanted to go backwards in an organization. And you see this everywhere. Now the thing about uh, risk and then adversity is you've got to have persistence. Mm -hmm. And this is what a lot, a lot of guys that want to go out and do their own thing don't have persistence. Right. Tenacity. Got to, tenacity, there's the brick wall. You've got to keep hammering the brick wall until yeah. you go through. Yeah. And to give you a great example, IS, it's been eight years. Now, arguably the first four or five was a science experiment while I was running DC, mm -hmm. but now that I'm fully into it, I've been hitting this wall. And it's only now the chips are starting to form off the side where these large scale uh, integrators, for instance, we'd never signed a large scale integrator. We've done lots of smaller guys that are running it, but we'd never got one. And if we get this one, and like we, well, actually I'm gonna get three, and they all deal with one particular vendor and one distributor, and the engines start talking together, I can prove the point that network effect works in a channel yes. context for this data, but that's taken eight years. And that's about normal though, isn't it? For a lot of businesses that sort of said that there's multiple break points or multiple points, like the yeah, first, get past year one, whatever, you know? get past year three, get yep. past year five, but they typically say after year seven, once you get into years eight, nine, and 10, if your business is there and it's been sustainable till then and it's continue, can still be sustainable, yep. so long as you're not just resting on your laurels, that's when things usually start to explode and a business yeah. goes to the next level. Is well, that what your experience it, has shown too? Basically, but I'm, um, just like I tell everyone, you've got to keep learning. I am learning to build a software business. I've never built a software business. Mm -hmm. I know business, but in distribution, and I know everyone's going to laugh at this, but you buy something, you sell something, you take the margin, <laughs> you reinvest, and you buy another one or two, and you keep going from there. So it's instant fix. And for someone who's kind of, I reckon I've got a bit of ADHD in me, that's great because I'm fast moving, let's go. Software is let's pour a bucket of money into this thing and hope at some point 
it comes out the other side. And of course, you see American companies, a lot of them don't come out the other side in mm -hmm. uh, R&D or they fall over. So we, we have um, spent all of those years with me throwing money in, praying to the gods. We came out uh, into profit two years ago. And as soon as I went profit, I went, no, 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 we're going to go faster. So I'm pouring more so money back in. in. And I think there's another big message. So there's so many little messages that you're sending that are so powerful for our audience, right? You know, have tenacity, keep going, don't stop, put your balls on the line, yeah. right? Get right out there. Don't expect that you're going to be successful. And just because you're successful, don't rape your business. Absolutely. Well, Stick it we back never, in, uh, grow I mean, the business. You know me, we, Nick and I never raped the business. We paid ourselves a reasonable at-market salary uh -huh. and everything else was reinvested. Right, and, and that's took, why you've grown and been successful. Yeah, that's right. Multiple times. Um, but the, the key tip for anyone who's starting out as an entrepreneur and they're facing the adversity thing, Winston Churchill, my favorite quote, quote when you're going through hell, keep going yeah you can't absolutely. just stop in the middle no. of it you're just gonna burn right yeah. <laughs> fantastic all right so just one last question for you okay you we spoke about who you may have had a conversation with etc but dead or alive who would you want to have oh it'd absolutely be winston churchill winston i churchill. mean you, if you ever read his biography which is a massive mountain of book thank god for kindle <laughs> <laughs> um he has touched so many parts of history from the boer war when he got captured to um, Shackleton's uh, ill-fated uh, Antarctica trip to obviously World War II is the obvious one mm -hmm. um, to inventing tanks right he was the driver behind all of these bits and there's not anywhere in history that Winston hasn't kind of touched and he did this whilst being an artist and doing all these other things that were completely unrelated the, the man was a machine if you right. read through all of these the impact he's had so yeah, so I was. It was it, that'd be my first prize. My second prize would be Nick, because when Nick and I sit down, we always have an argument. We come out better. <laughs> That's fantastic. And for those of you who want to know who Nick is, Nick Rikios, Scott's long-term friend and business partner. Um, there is a podcast and a video interview with Nick. Have a watch of that. Scott mentioned the yin and the yang. You'll see the two guys on the couch. Watch that one after this one. You'll see the yin and the yang. <laughs> um, Scotty, mate, thank you so much for taking the time out. I know no you're problem. in Oz just for a couple of weeks. Loved having you on the couch, having a chat. I know everybody who's watching this would also be getting enormous value. Good. Have a look at those little tidbits. Listen to those subtleties with Scott um, because it's those subtleties that will have the biggest impact on what you do as you move forward in your careers. Scotty, mate, great to have Thanks, you Robbie. here. Cheers.